Morning everybody, I'm Julie Greaves, I'm Head of Sustainability at Hertfordshire County Council. Uh, that means that I'm responsible for delivering the Sustainable Hertfordshire Strategy and Action Plan. So I'm really pleased to be here and to talk you through what, we're, what we are seeking to achieve. Thank you. So first of all, very, very quickly to, to take it from the global down to the local level. Um, you may have seen this before, this is a sim very simplified uh, uh, approach to visualising global climate change since the 1800s to the present day. It's called the Warming Stripes. Uh, by Ed Hawkins from, from Reading University. It's a really powerful tool and visual aid to show what's happened over the last uh, 100 or so years since the Industrial Revolution to the present day and what's caused this problem that we're now trying to, to deal with. So what does that mean for us in terms of the UK? Again, there's some nice images there that show you what's going to happen over the next few years. You've got present day uh, on the left-hand side, uh, moving forward, depending on what happens in terms of the degree increases and what the levels of uh, precipitation and therefore flood risk might be across the whole of the UK. Just to put that into perspective in terms of us in the east of England, we are one of the driest regions and yet we have the highest level of water, one of the highest levels of water consumption. And this gives you an idea in terms of the CO2 emissions per head. So you can see you've got the east of England there and the UK, and then next to that one is Hertfordshire. So it just gives, us, gives you an idea of the, 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 the level of the problem that we're trying to deal with on a, on a much more local scale as in terms of Hertfordshire as a county. East of England region in terms of, of heat, Again, these are some uh, visual representations of what's going to happen, scorching temperatures and also water shortages. As I said, we've got a, a bit of a, a combination of situations whereby we're the driest region and yet we have one of the highest water consumptions, but we have some significant flooding that's taking place across the county as well. Another, uh, I'm gl really glad actually, Phil, you mentioned it's not just about carbon, it's about biodiversity as well. Our, our strategy covers that I I uh, aspect as well. This map is quite frightening and it basically shows you that the change in temperatures means that we're going to lose quite a lot of our native species. And so by 2050, we could have no more beech trees. And that's not very nice to think about really. It's a, if you see a, a, a beech hedge, um, you know when it's not there because they're quite significant and quite striking. So we could be losing quite a lot of the habitat that, we get, that we're, we're used to and we have grown up with. Bring it right down to a local level. These are pictures that have all been taken across Hertfordshire. You've got some images there of some very severe flooding uh, that's taken place over the last couple of years. You've got uh, impacts in terms of housing, impacts in terms of business, people's livelihoods, vans that have been swept away. You've got road closures, all happening because of a flooding situation. Severe weather events, our colleagues in community protection are constantly being called out because of severe weather events, and that can be hot as well as cold. Over the last, uh, actually over the last year, we've had hailstorms, snow, and then complete opposite end of the scale, we've had tarmac that's been bubbling up and melting. And that's just in Hertfordshire. So we are seeing those impacts right here, right now on a local level. The picture there with the, with the um, a gravestone, that's in a Hertfordshire river. And Hertfordshire is very, very specific in some of its biodiversity and some of its nature uh, environments. And we have one of the rarest habitats in terms of chalk streams in Hertfordshire, and they are being impacted by the level of abstraction that's taking place in terms of us as consumers, water consumers. And then we've also got some issues with regard to disease. Again, warming temperatures, damp conditions mean that we're seeing a, a, a lot of different types of disease and also pests as well. Um, so we've got ash dieback, we've got oak processionary moth, we've got all different things that are coming uh, more and more commonplace and actually have a, not just an impact on biodiversity, but an impact on construction uh, cycles as well and an impact on the market. So those are all pictures from Hertfordshire. Thanks. Um, so we're here from the Hertfordshire County Council. What are we doing about it and what does it mean for us? This is just hopefully a little bit of a, a demonstration of what kind of levels of carbon emissions we're talking about. Anybody want to hazard a guess? What's the highest level of emissions for us as a county council? Schools. Who, say, say that again, that last word? Schools. Schools. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. 100% right. Yeah, if you click on. Um, total emissions for us, our baseline year was 1819 and approximately 50,000 tonnes of CO2 uh, per annum. And actually, we've had that reassessed and 
that's a conservative estimate. We're probably a little bit higher than that in terms of CO2 emissions per annum. But yeah, schools contribute around 30,000 tonnes per annum. The school estate is huge and it's old. And so we're tackling that kind of uh, situation actually on a daily basis now, working with our colleagues in, prop in property and also in resources to try and tackle that particular issue. So that's us as a county council. And then in moving on, if we look at Hertfordshire, oh sorry, context-wise, people always say plant trees. Planting trees is great, don't get me wrong, but it will not solve this particular situation, this problem. Uh, Hertfordshire County Council owns part of Broxbourne National Nature Reserve. If you haven't been there, I recommend that you go and have a walk around Broxbourne. It's a fantastic place to go. Lots of lovely beech trees, uh, hornbeams, etc. The piece that we own only captures 419 tonnes of CO2 per annum. So, and we've got 50,000 tonnes to deal with per annum. So planting, we haven't got enough space to plant the trees that are needed to sequester that kind of levels of carbon. And that's just talking about us as an organisation. Uh, in terms of Hertfordshire, so the county, anyone want to shout out what's the biggest issue in terms of the county? Mm. Transport is the biggest issue. Yeah, transport. And that's, that's similar to the country as a whole. Transport is a significant uh, uh, CO2 emitter. So again, our baseline year was 1819, uh, 6 million um, CO2 emissions, tons, sorry, CO2 emissions equivalent. Transport contributed the highest proportion, 47% of emissions. So we are really pleased to see the government's documentation around decarbonising transport, but it's all about us and what we do and our behaviours and whether or not we actually take, a, take the choice or make the decision and are given the option to choose something other than a vehicle to make our journey. Thank you. So what does sustainable Hertfordshire mean? Why, why how, what are we doing in this space? Um, and we were, we were actually challenged just to why we were calling ourselves sustainable Hertfordshire. Um, some colleagues said, you know, people don't understand what sustainable means. Well, our challenge back to that was, well, then we need to be able to talk to people about it and educate them. And actually, we all need to understand what sustainable means. So we have stuck with sustainable Hertfordshire. And uh, if you'd like to click on, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, hopefully, some of you will be aware of where its definition comes from. Um, the 1987 Brundtland Report, Our Common Future. Climate change and um, uh, environmentalists are not a new thing. They are obviously very much in the forefront now but I've been working in this particular area for 21 years. Um, so, you know, it's not a new thing. So 1987, the Brunton Report, Our Common Future, defined sustainable development as doing what you need to do, but you don't then disadvantage the people that are coming along after you. And put in the simplest of terms, basically what sustainable development means, thinking beyond today. Every single action that you take today will have an impact on maybe you and maybe somebody else tomorrow. So it's thinking about beyond today and every action that you take will have consequences. Thank you. So what are we doing um, and where do we start off in terms of the global picture and bringing it down in terms of policy? We've just had COP26 and the United Nations back in 2015 uh, defined the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, 17 of them, and they're, they're brilliant. They're principles for a really good an inclusive life across the globe. And we have made sure that we reference the environmental aspects of the SDGs within our own Sustainable Hertfordshire strategy. And then the other SDGs are referenced in our other documentation that we're responsible for. County Council is responsible for a lot of delivering of services and they have um, therefore have, have impact on and are impacted by all of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we've referenced them in our strategy. 2019, July 2019, our then leader, David Williams, stood up in full council and declared a climate emergency. And us as officers were like, oh my gosh, what on earth have you done? We have to really you know, sit up and do something now. It was a really good thing that he did that because we ha literally haven't stopped since then. So from 2019, declaration of that climate emergency, he then said, we need to, to prepare the Sustainable Hertfordshire strategy. I want to see action fast. And we prepared the Sustainable Hertfordshire strategy from July to December. And the strategy itself was approved at Cabinet in March 2020. 
absolute milestone moment. There was only two items on that agenda, response to COVID and sustainable Hertfordshire. So that gives you an idea of the, the level of importance that's been given to sustainable Hertfordshire. Straight away after the uh, strategy was approved, we then started to think, okay, we've got the strategy. What do we actually physically do in terms of the actions? And so we then prepared the action plan. We involved every single department, every single service area, all during lockdown. And bear in mind that we're responsible for children's services, adult care services, community protection and public health. They were fully in the forefront of tackling COVID and yet they still engaged with the Sustainable Hertfordshire Action Plan. We have published our action plan, it's on our website. We've got our own web pages, Sustainable Hertfordshire. You can see the strategy, you can see the action plan. There's over 200 actions in our action plan. It gives you an idea of the breadth that we have to cover. 120 of those, 128, sorry, of those actions are new ones. So not just business as usual, they're new things that we need to start doing or, or need to really ramp up. Uh, and then the most significant, another significant step was in uh, the, the budget. So February 2021, the Sustainable Hertfordshire Central Fund was established, and our uh, again our Conservative administration said 10 million capital, 2 million revenue, plough that into Sustainable Hertfordshire and get things done. So another significant milestone. So what does our strategy say, and how how is it going to work? We were very keen to make sure that our strategy wasn't just about us. Um, actually, if you look at the percentage in terms of our carbon uh, emissions, it's quite small. But we've got a resident population of 1.2 million. So we wanted to make sure we were doing what we could to help enable and inspire everybody else who lives in and, and works in Hertfordshire. So we've got lead, enable and inspire as our circles of influence. Us as a leader in terms of our organisation, what do we do? What do we have control over? What can we change? And then others in terms of enabling, inspiring behaviour change policies, etc. And working with partners, including University of Hertfordshire. We've got nine central ambitions. The first four are to do with us. Uh, carbon neutrality by 2030, making sure we are ready for future climate. So, for example, if there's a severe weather event, can our adults care services cope with that? Uh, improving nature on our own land. We're quite a big landowner, quite a lot of which is rural estate, but some with, of which is the built estate, and we're looking at improving biodiversity on our own land, and then reducing what we throw away, uh, making sure we're actually being more responsible in terms of what we use and, and procurement practices. And then five to nine are the ambitions that are outward facing. So again, um, to do with the county. So net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. That's the legislative target. We're hoping to, to achieve that before 2050, but that's not just us, it's everybody. Making sure our communities are ready for future climates. What can we do to help them be ready? Improving wildlife on all land, clean air for all, real big uh, important factor in terms of clean air, and then tripling resource efficiency. Again, about behavior change and procurement and offering advice and guidance. Thank you. And just to say, we're not doing this alone. There's no way we could do this alone. We have to make sure we work in partnership. Hertfordshire is a two-tier authority area, which means we've got one county council and 10 district and borough councils. And we've joined together to form the Hertfordshire Climate Change and Sustainability Partnership. It's purposefully local authority-based partnership. However, we do have the local enterprise partnership on there and also all of our subgroups, which I'll come on to in a second, have input from externals uh, in terms of consultants as well as University of Hertfordshire and other partners working on them. So the partnership was formed. We've been formed well over a year now and we've, we've, we've um, progressed. We've identified four priority actions when we had our first meeting and those priority ac actions, water, biodiversity, transport and carbon, were identified because each of us have differing roles and responsibilities, but we all have a part to play in those particular four priority areas, and therefore we can make a county-wide contribution, and by working together, we can be greater than the sum of our parts. So that's why we chose those four initial priority themes. Yeah. We then went and produced four action plans relating to those priority themes. So we've got subgroups which are made up of, of officers from each of the district and borough councils and the county council, and where appropriate, we bring in external partners. Uh, so for example, in the water um, plan, we brought in the Environment Agency, Hartford Middlesex Wildlife Trust, 
the water companies, the chalk stream representatives and the, and the Colne Valley Partnership and the Lee Valley Partnership. We brought in people who knew about that particular subject area to help us develop the plans. And they cover the same kind of topics. So planning is very important. We are all planning authorities. So the County Council is planning authority for minerals and waste as well as our own development. And then the District and Borough Council are planning authorities for everything else. So shops, houses, I industrial, you name it, they, they are the planning authority. And so planning policies are really important, making sure we've got po local policies that help us tackle climate change. Adaptation, mitigation and resilience, all three aspects can be covered in planning. So all our action plans talk about planning policy. They all talk about behaviour change uh, and working with partners to change behaviours. They all talk about lobbying, if appropriate and when appropriate, depending on our political persuasion. We have to be obviously very careful in terms of who, who we are working for. Um, but if there's, a, if there's a specific issue that we feel that government should be stepping up to, then we will lobby on that particular persuasion. Um, and then campaigns. We've already run some, some joint comms campaigns around Save Our Streams um, and water uh, consumption reduction campaigns, and we will be running some more over the next few months. And it's about amplification, not duplication, of the messages that are already out there. So we've got our four action plans already in place. They were a, a put, um, adopted or, a, or launched rather, sorry, launched two weeks ago, I think, uh, at our COP26 webinar, which Phil gave a presentation, keynote speech at, um, to much uh, appreciation. Everybody who was there thought, yep, yeah, great, thanks very much. You've made a really good step forward there. Now let's see some more positive action. So moving forward, uh, we have actually got some new, two new, uh, two new subgroups already established, one on behaviour change and one on adaptation. They're very new subgroups, but there are two new streams of work for the HGCSP. A few key messages, certainly from what we've learned over the very short space of time from 2019 to the present day, it's good to talk. Um, it's really, really good to talk to people about climate change and sustainability because you actually do then get a really good conversation, you engage with them, you understand where they're coming from, they understand where you're coming from, and that's a much better way of actually getting people to, to potentially make a change. So it's really good to talk to people, not just in terms of our own organisation, but in terms of others. Second one, you're all at university, great. Knowledge is power, absolutely knowledge is power. I, I will not stand up here in front and say to you, become a vegan, become a vegetarian, uh, don't buy palm oil, I don't know, sell your car and, and walk, whatever. You go and find your own knowledge out. Go and do your own research. Get it from trusted resources, please. My son is ooh, just he's going to be 18, actually, in a, in a few months' time. Some of the resources he, go, he's, he says is trusted are like, no. No, go and find another one, please. And go and find another one after that. You know, go to four different ones and then see if you get the same uh, information. And I'm sure you know that when you're writing your essays, etc. Don't believe the first thing you read. Actually carry on and, and see where the other sources are. So knowledge is absolutely power. I genuinely believe that. And then share that knowledge. That's a, that's a really good one. So linking the good to talk and the knowledge is power. And then the last quote, does anybody know where that quote comes from? fine. We have it as our, te our, it's our team motto. Uh, and we have it on, our, on some of our signatures. No one is too small to make a difference. And it's actually Greta Thunberg who said that. And I, again, I genuinely believe that. We are 7.7 .7 billion people in the planet. Yeah, that's a lot of individuals. If we all did something tiny, actually that works out to be something massive. So yeah, we've had COP26. You had you know, some important people standing up there talking, blah, blah, blah. Actually, let us do something on a local level and really, really make a difference. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to Tanya, and she's going to talk to you about the communication side of things. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk. So I'm Tanya Pasquale. I'm the Sustainable Hertfordshire Community Engagement Programme Manager and I'm responsible for taking the sustainable strategy uh, action out into the community to collaborate and engage with you all. 
Um, so, as Julie was just saying, we've just had COP26, uh, Climate Change, United Nations Climate Change Conference. It's attracted an awful lot of interest, a lot of media, uh, and a lot of conversations down on the ground. Uh, so we want to kind of use and build on that. So we've had, as you know, the main goals were mitigation to reduce carbon emissions, adaptation to restore our biodiversity, which Phil and Julie have mentioned is as important, is equally important, if not more. Um, finance, yes, we, everyone, all the countries and everyone needs a finance in order to implement. And, uh, but where I'm really focused on and key on is collaboration. It's on their, one of their main goals is for us all to get together and collaborate together. So why, so our theme is Sustainable Hertfordshire uh, taking uh, COP26 forward. Okay, so why take COP26 forward? Yes, it, you know, it was a big uh, group, but we want to use that as a springboard and take that out into the community and start talking. We want to keep the message simple. Um, and, that, and, and make all those COP26 kind of all the relevant actions relevant specific to Hertfordshire. We want to focus on supporting communities and businesses within Hertfordshire. We want to help to support to find, for you all to find alternative options and uh, uh, different ways to make our lifestyles and to make our change and behaviour change much easier. So we've got quite a few uh, a series of events and initiatives planned for the coming month. Um, we're going to kickstart uh, next week, in fact, on Saturday the 27th of November. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment um, with an eco fair. Um, in the new year, we're going to have a look at, um, we're going to do organise a youth and schools uh, climate debate um, their own kind of COP26, and then we're going to have a, a, a bigger, larger um, conglomerate of, of groups and organisations together uh, in our own Hertfordshire COP in May uh, 2022. But in between that, there are three key focuses, but in between that, we're going to continue the conversation, continue the, community, uh, the, the communication and the various, with some various initiatives. So, as I said, next week, Hot off the press, just got the flyers here. So if anybody would like to pick up a flyer, uh, you can come and see us um, afterwards. Um, so, uh, so people are asking me, you know, why, why are you doing an eco fair at the end of November? It's a very good question. I ask that myself every day in terms of organizing it and especially within the parameters of COVID. We're doing it because we want to, to use and make the most of COP26 while it's still fresh in people's minds and the conversation is still, uh, is still going on. Also, we don't want to do anything too intensive because we understand that people are kind of like winding down for end of year uh, and the kind of holiday period. So what are we having? So we've got uh, around about 50 um, uh, exhibitors coming um, uh, from uh, our different services within Hertfordshire County Council, our partners, uh, businesses, and organizations all coming round with a specific thing to showcase what we're all doing for sustainability, but also at the same time on that day is to offer ideas and inspiration for yourselves. So any visitors that come, they'll take something home, whether it's physical or whether it's an idea or an inspired uh, motivation. Um, so that's gonna be 10 till four, and that's at County Hall in Hartford, so that's our main kind of building site. Thank you. Um, so one of the initiatives, so it's all very well doing one event in one location, but Hertfordshire is a very large county with a very kind of large rural and urban um, areas. So what one of the initiatives we're about to launch is we've created a Hertfordshire uh, interactive web map. Um, I'm a geographer, so I always like to kind of like have maps, and I think it's a visual, I think uh, a picture tells a thousand words, and, and, and visuals are so important. So what we're going to have is a visual, uh, is an interactive map on our website, and so that people can, of initiatives and events, so that people can actually see what's happening where. 
what's happening in their community so that they can attend or participate, but also what's happening in certain communities so that they can replicate, be inspired and replicate in their own community. Um, the other initiative we're about to uh, launch will be, as I said before, they've got this large kind of rural and urban areas. Uh, we want to get out into the community. So we're creating these portable uh, information pop-up um, uh, hubs um, that will be displayed in libraries and uh, community centres and youth groups and business areas. So it will be, it's almost like a community, think of it as a community notice board. It will be focused specifically on sustainability. It will offer that, uh, it will offer communities for them, again, to find out what's happening and where and how they can get involved. It will offer how-to guides because you can't just take, as Julie said earlier, you can't just take things away. You have to offer an alternative options. So it's about how-to guides, how people can change and where they can uh, get some information or, or kind of uh, support from. And it's also, at the same time, <coughs> it's an opportunity for us as a county council to collect information to better understand what support or particular support that that, uh, that community uh, needs or requires. So, uh, as I said earlier, so in the new year, hopefully in January, uh, we're going to host uh, at County <coughs> Council a schools and youth uh, groups uh, debate. So it'll be a simulated debate, so they'll have their own uh, kind of COP26. So we'll bring representatives from different schools around the county and youth groups around the county together in one place so that they can have uh, these debates and then they can create and come up with their own action plans. I'm not talking, I'm not interested in pledges anymore. We don't have time for pledges, it's action. So they'll create their own action plans and agree and then take them to their respective schools and youth groups uh, in order to implement. Uh, and then later on uh, in spring, um, we're going to host uh, our Hertfordshire COP. So that's, uh, that's the opportunity of bringing businesses, communities, voluntary organisations, local authorities, University of Hertfordshire, I'm delighted that we're collaborating with, with them, uh, schools and youth groups, bringing everyone together around one massive table so that we can cross-pollinate um, the ideas and initiatives <coughs> and we can share best practices and produce collective action plans that will hopefully lead on to a really good conducive climate action network and uh, to create um, a citizen assembly and a climate commission. So that's what we've got planned, um, but we can't do this without everyone's involvement. So I'd like to just end uh, kind of uh, this morning, the, the talk this morning by saying, please get involved. We want to understand what the needs are and we want, you know, support. So we very much look um, forward to collaborating with you all. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions if you would like to. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, thank you. I, it's great. I mean, to chat with all the things I was referring to in terms of the local action. Um, there's, there's a real issue, though. Um, I'm not just wondering what the, the county council's view is on this. Um, but we've got 100,000 houses proposed for Hertfordshire. Yeah. Uh, and with current house building techniques, with current transport infrastructure, with current land availability, with current water mm -hmm. scarcity, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to, to meet the, the goals that you're rightly championing. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, uh, I'm always one for lobbying elected representatives, so having written to the Transport, Environment and Housing Ministry, if they require it, it's a local issue. Yeah. When I wrote to the county council, they said, well, we're, our hands are tied because it's national policy. So we've got a really big problem here. Uh, you know, anyone who's driven on the A1 in Rushdown knows just yeah. how big the issue is right now, and that's before. So I just wonder what, what, what the council's view was on how it's possible to squeeze in 100,000 homes which are going to be built using techniques that haven't yeah. changed much in 70 years. Uh, and transport infrastructure 
Inspector Fletcher. Uh, yes. It just seems to be a really thorny issue, and it vexes me, and I'm sure it does you, and I just wonder what the council's view was on yeah. it. Uh, so the, the question is around the fact that we are subject to unprecedented levels of growth across Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire is a, a 50 nearly 50% uh, green belt county, which means that we find it very difficult to be able to, s to find suitable locations to build anything, let alone housing. It's absolutely it's everything that goes with it. So 100,000 new homes and 100,000 new jobs are what's required. Uh, and that they come to that conclusion based on objectively assessed needs. So each individual district and borough will be responsible for calculating their own housing requirements based on population projections. Um, and then the uh, individual districts and boroughs will have to produce their local plan to be able to identify potential suitable locations for that growth to take place. The re that one of the, um, the, the reasons that the growth board was established was because of the unprecedented levels of growth. So the growth board is a, is a relatively new, again, a partnership. All of the t 10 districts and borough councils and the county council and the LEP f uh, formally created the, growth, the Hertfordshire Growth Board. And it was originally chaired by David Williams, the leader of the council. It is now chaired by Richard Roberts, our new leader of the council. Um, in fact, both David Williams and Richard Roberts have both said they want to see good growth, they want to see sustainable growth, they want to see responsible growth across Hertfordshire because we are that green belt county. Um, and they want to see growth in suitable locations, appropriate locations, and they want to see it done in the best possible way. There is a challenge wh which goes with that in that we're not the ones who build the actual houses. That is down to individual developers, but the market is changing. Um, the growth board have established two sub boards. We've got the housing sub board and we've also now got a developers forum. So the developers are actually in that forum and they're being held to account. Us as, as um, sorry, I'm not a planning officer anymore. When I was a planning officer and my colleagues in planning and my colleagues in, in uh, climate change and sustainability at additional borough level and county level, we'll be having conversations with the planning um, planning developers when they're writing their master plans and saying we want to see net zero as a as a benchmark um, so that we can we can push for that kind of, of um, exemplar development across Hertfordshire but unfortunately it does require national regulations and guidance to be able to adhere to building regulations are, go are going to be updated but not until 2024 and we've got a uh, planning reform has been halted because of um, a couple of reasons, one around COVID, one around COP26. So we're still waiting for planning reform to come into to, to any concrete decisions. We've just had the Environment Bill enacted two weeks ago. So the long awaited Environment Bill has now become an act. We have the 2021 Environment Act and there are specifics in there around biodiversity net gain, which has to come via new development. Um, and other measures and mechanisms to, to really improve and stop the, the loss of biodiversity. So we've got a couple of different things that are happening all at the same time here in terms of national and local um, to try and push forward some really exemplar developments across Hertfordshire. We've also got uh, at least three, if not more, um, garden town developments that are happening. And I saw John Sturzager's name up there, um, your, new, your new colleague in terms of, of the Ebenezer Howard School of Planning. He's heavily involved. Uh, with the work that we're doing via the Growth Board and some other, other work that we're doing via HUCSP. Um, we've got Tarlow Gilston Garden Town, uh, we've got the Hemel Garden Communities, um, and they are being pushed forward on the principles of Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities. And that is about combining the fact that you need homes, you need, this, you need the jobs, you need the infrastructure. We're also working with your colleagues in the um, Innovation Lab and the mobility side of things with regard to transport. Um, so we've got a lot of links going on with the University of Hertfordshire already and we have the local transport plan that's already been adopted. It's now being reviewed and will be updated to take into account the carbonisation, ag decarbonisation agenda from central government. But there is that push for making sure we provide infrastructure to help people make the choice not to get in a car. So it is really difficult, it's really challenging with, and that's why we've got this partnership approach to it. But I would actually, if there's if there's one thing that you could that you could do, it would be to lobby house builders and say you're not going to you don't want that level of building standard. You want that level of building standard, and we're doing the same, and we have conversations with them.
which is that in 2019, he said, David Williams decided to declare Catholic uh, as far as it's concerned, you see. Um, and I, I, I should say for the previous speaker that uh, Mrs. Barnett, which is the party of Hart, but it's only the party of Hart, hopefully, yeah. uh, we actually belong in the London Borough of Barnet. And the London Borough of Barnet, I think, is the largest London borough. And it has not declared a climate emergency and in fact it refuses to do so. Uh, so, well maybe it's not a threat, maybe I should <laughs> sort of say that, <laughs> that we are also appalled at that. that that's it, and that's a fair, st it's a statement isn't it? And there are a lot of organisations who haven't declared a climate emergency. But there are a lot who have, um, and you can actually see uh, Climate Action UK run a, a rolling toll of who has declared. And if your local orga organisation or your local authority hasn't, then carry on campaigning for them to do so. Yeah. 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 We so we, we work with a lot of different local authorities over a number of different service areas. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of climate action, <coughs> we're part of the climate action group under the local government association. I'm not sure that either at Enfield or, or Barnet are part of that particular grouping. I've certainly worked with Enfield in the past to do with planning um, um, and to do with minerals, min with minerals and waste, sorry, <coughs> but not at the moment in terms of climate change. But we, we're, we're seeking to, to amend that. We've just made uh, links with Essex County Council and want to work with them in partnership on some, some really significant areas of work. We've got some, uh, some conversations happening with them at the moment. Um, because they are our bordering uh, county and they're doing exactly the same as we are in terms of climate commissions uh, and putting forward their strategies and action plans. So we are making links with other, with other local authorities, but not we haven't specifically with Barnet. Your point about, sorry, just very briefly, your point about 100,000 homes being depressing, um, the, the reason that we need to, to deliver 100,000 homes is because that's the, number of, that's the number of people who need homes. And we have, to yeah. Yeah, that, uh, you're right, no, you're right. Being ch yes, you're absolutely right. So there is there is an argument to be had about objectively assessed needs. Absolutely there is. And that's what happens through the planning process. So each individual district and borough will have a housing number that they have calculated. That will be put up to scrutiny. They'll have to go through several rounds of public engagement and public consultation, and then they will be taken through a public examination, an examination in public by the planning inspectorate. And the inspectorate will have to agree that those are the numbers that need to be delivered across their particular district or borough. They are open to scrutiny, they are. Yeah. 
Ecco, ti dirò appunto, ci giriamo prima. Appunto, sono stata quando sono stata a Cagliari mm. e ho fatto un incontro mi ha detto yeah. che ti ha sentito il corpo e ti ha raccolto il tuo corpo di fotografia di quando sei a Cagliari. Il primo che mi porta a la foto di te. Perché tu sei sempre mm-hmm. quando sei a Cagliari. Mm-hmm. Io sono stata molto a Cagliari fino a dopo il corpo. Yeah, um, I don't work in, in tra- transport planning, I'll say that straight away. Uh, there's a lot that is going on in transport, in transport planning with my colleagues in terms of the delivery of the next local transport plan, the Harts and Essex rapid transport system. They've just launched the demand responsive transport system um, and we're in the process of buying some electric vehicles to be able to boost that particular offer. Uh, switching, trying to switch away from diesel as best as we possibly can. It's extremely expensive to switch away from, from diesel when you've already got uh, a fleet that's in place. And it's not our fleet, it's the company's fleet. So there, there are some things that are happening on a local level. Um, I can't speak for my colleagues and I, I wouldn't want to say something that was wrong. So I think what's best is if I take your comments back and then get somebody to, to respond to them directly. I know that, that um, there's specific funds around active travel um, and actually one of the positives from COVID is that we, get, we got some more money to be able to focus on active travel because one of the things we wanted to uh, keep from COVID was the fact that people were more active in their travel habits than being in a car. So we want to try and perpetuate that and not let not people switch back. So there has been some investment in active travel. But it's a, it, it is a difficult difficult thing to do. I get your pers- your perception in terms of the danger uh, of cycling on Hertfordshire roads and that's something we talk about uh, in our induction even with our staff. Um, and that's why we've got the bikeability that we offer to all schools across Hertfordshire. Um, but you're right, we need the infrastructure for, be able to, to, to for people to be able to be safe on the roads. So there is some work going on, but I don't want to say something that, that isn't quite right. So I'll take your comments back. Uh, if I may, and, and get somebody to get back to you directly. Okay. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Next Friday. Yes. The day before. The day before you get there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've had <coughs> we've had a mixed reaction. Um, we do actually do get some people emailing us and saying stop peddling your climate change lies. Still, uh, and yet other people say brilliant, fantastic. How can we help you to implement? And actually, that's more of the what we we get. We you know the the voices of of dissent are, are small, thank goodness. Um, but we the majority of people say you are not doing enough. And the reality of it is that we can only do what we can do. And if there was 20 more of us, <laughs> then we could do more. Um, and we've put a bid in for, for more staff and more resources to, to, to be able to do more. So we're doing as best we possibly can. We're actually s- having to say to people, we, we can't do any more at the moment. We are so stretched. Um, doing things like this and coming out and talking to people is really important. Uh, and we, we do see the value in that, but we've got lots of other things we, we need to be getting on and doing as well. So we need some more resources to be able to, to deliver what we want to and do more. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say so. Yes. Yeah. And obviously, we, we, you need to bear in mind we're working in a political environment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, there, you know, we have that to deal with as well. Yeah. Talking of a, a political environment, um, have you heard of Take the Jump? Take the Jump dot org? Uh, yes, where they l link uh, act individual actions together. Yes, yeah. we have. We looked into that. Uh, it's very expensive to, to join. Um, it's so, we. <laughs> to join. Yes. You have to you have to pay to to be part of it on the internet on the oh web pages. My yeah. Um, so it's safe to say that Waverley Council has joined me. Okay. Uh, although Waverley Council and some of its initial publications thought that uh, take the jump dot org was a company, uh, and I seem to have pushed take uh, the jump uh, into becoming. Ah, interesting. Okay. Oh, we might.